I'm Rob Trusinski. This is Symposium, where we bring people together to have conversations about the nature of liberalism. Uh, my guests today are George Will and Stephen Pinker. George Will, uh, most of you would know as a Washington Post columnist. Uh, thanks for coming on. Glad to be with you. And Stephen Pinker is a professor of psychology at Harvard and author most recently of uh, Enlightenment Now, a defense of the values of the Enlightenment. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. And one of the reasons I wanted to have the, the, these two people on is to this idea of bringing people together in a conversation about liberalism. Now, Stephen Pinker probably represents, you know, in the most broadest sense, represents what we would think of as 20th century liberalism, whereas George Will represents maybe a more 19th century liberalism, uh, that, uh, more of a classical liberalism. But the idea here is to talk about, you know, what liberalism means in that broader sense and the sense that would encompass both the 20th century liberals and and the uh, and the the classical liberals, uh, many of whom actually call themselves conservatives, and to uh, to talk about what liberalism is, maybe in the more in the political philosopher sense, uh, not rather in the you know we have liberalism in this sort of partisan political sense that we use in everyday discourse, but in the political philosopher sense, it means advocacy of a free society. So I, I think I want to start with with George Will on this because uh, you know you describe yourself as conservative, you have sort of abjured the idea of trying to reclaim the label of liberal. And yet, I think you would think of yourself as a classical liberal. So what does liberalism mean in, in that broader sense? What does it, what do you think liberalism should mean in that broader sense? What are the central ideas needed to, to define it and defend it? Uh, yes, it's a little late in the day to try and sort out the terminological train wreck of American political categories, but in fact, American conservatives properly understood, that is to say Madisonians, Lincolnians, et cetera, are the legatees of classical liberalism. You said 18th, 19th century, I'd say 18th century, but that's a quibble. Uh, I think the, the central idea is that liberalism was born in, uh, in the United States as an assertion of individualism, a, a, a society in which we believe in individual agency, that liberals uh, resist the tendency to subsume people into categories and into groups, what we now call identity politics, and resist the idea that because we are socially situated, which is a commonplace, a common sense truth, therefore somehow uh, our agency is, is outsourced or compromised. Uh, it, it, to, to me, one of the fundamental purposes of liberalism in the, in the early 21st century is to insist upon the reality of human agency. That's, that's okay. Now, let me then go back to Stephen and talk about what does liberalism mean in, in the way you would define it, or the, what, are the what are the principles that you would like to see as the basis for an American liberalism? Yes, well, like, like most people who study language, I have to uh, concede that it doesn't matter how I define the word. word <laughs> the meaning of words uh, emerges spontaneously in terms of uh, how everyone uh, chooses to use them. And in the case of liberalism, uh, as, as we've noted, it has a, a number of meanings. There is the classical li liberal sense, today often called conservatism, uh, right. ironically enough. It's often used as a uh, synonym for leftism, but on the other hand, it's also used as a synonym for libertarianism, particularly when it's prefixed by neo. So the word itself is, uh, uh, is, is highly polysemous, as we say, uh, many meanings. Uh, I, I would identify it, like, like George, um, as the, um, uh, the belief that political institutions uh, should be considered as um, under uh, negotiated among equal rational individuals uh, uh, and subject to continual updating. That's, I think, approximately how classical liberalism might be uh, characterized. In that regard, it contrasts with uh, various kinds of tribalism that the political institutions are um, uh, repositories for the soul of some nation or, or ethnic group or, or uh, race or uh, identity categories as uh, George has identified its current manifestation. It um, can be contrasted with uh, authoritarian um, uh, institutions that uh, 
humans are so uh, flawed and compromised that we must subordinate ourselves to some authority wiser uh, than, than ourselves. Obviously contrasts with uh, uh, the theocratic and uh, religious conceptions of, uh, of institutions coming from scripture or from uh, authority. Uh, so that, that's how I would think of the, the, the overall core, um, but it has uh, different meanings depending on what you contrast with in that conversation. Now, the, uh, if I could uh, interject, the European conservatism became articulate and self-conscious in reaction to the French Revolution. And therefore, yeah, Edward Burke, it, was, so it was colored by, I would say tainted by, thrown an altar, blood and soil, defense of hierarchies and of sort of suspicion of change. When it crossed the Atlantic, uh, it became something very different. It became uh, a, a celebration in America, particularly, of change. Someone once said that the story of the Bible reduced to one sentence is God created man and woman and promptly lost control of events. And conservatives in America like the absence of control. That's the point. Conservatives celebrate uh, the spontaneous order of, a, of, of freely contracting consensual individuals, whereas those we call liberals today who actually are progressives and should be called progressives because they are the, the inheritors of a distinguished uh, intellectual pedigree, they say, in fact, the point of government is to uh, assert control to bring the change, social change under the, the conscious guidance of uh, particular experts and elites, usually those propounding progressivism. So uh, in, in that sense, uh, that it seems to me is why we ought to call today, people who call themselves liberals should be called progressives and, and own their, their heritage and get on with the argument. Well, let me, let me tie into something here that just that, uh, uh, Stephen, you talked about things being negotiated between equal rational individuals, but subject to change, which I think involves more of an idea that that social institutions will evolve democratically. And I think perhaps the role of democracy in liberalism is a point of difference in those two different visions. Yes, yeah, so I, I added that proviso of constantly subject to renegotiation to capture the idea that People associate liberalism with uh, with change and conservatism with uh, stasis, and of course there is the Burkean argument that stasis, for its own sake, uh, if not necessarily good, it certainly should be the default because we're always teetering on the precipice of, uh, of of chaos. And so, if some social arrangement has managed to keep us from each other's throats so far, um, don't discard it precipitously. That, of course, that's Burke's uh, reaction mm -hmm. to the French Revolution that, that, that George mentioned. Uh, and, and people associate liberalism with change, you know, not always accurately, because you know, nowadays liberals are highly small c conservative with regard to some institutions. <laughs> but th there, is, there is that. Also, just to pick up on something that George mentioned, another dimension, uh, you know, I think that political space is multidimensional. There isn't just a, a left to right divide. Right. But one of the dimensions that's kind of aligned with uh, the left-right and to some extent liberal conservative uh, dimension is whether the control of our, our darker side, of our, our violent impulses, is done by uh, outsourcing uh, control and in, indeed violence to um, uh, a disinterested institution, a government. I mean, this is the idea of Locke and Hobbes and. Uh, and, and Madison of, uh, we, we agree that for everyone's benefit, it's good to have a, a, a government that's vested with certain um, uh, powers in order to keep us from each other's throats, subject to feedback from, from those who are governed, um, as opposed to a culture of honor, uh, which is that every individual takes on the responsibility of protecting himself and his family from violence, by maintaining a credible threat of retaliation, including a willingness to avenge insults and a distrust of any central authority like a government that is uh, vested with responsibility to protect us from violence. And I think a major division between say Western Europe and the United States, or at least the, the South and Southwest of the United States 
is uh, on this side of the Atlantic, we have retained a kind of our own version of a culture of, of honor, not exactly Sicilian, but there is a kind of Hatfield and McCoy's um, uh, dueling culture that says it's up to every man to defend himself and his family. Uh, only a, a weakling would outsource it to the government. And indeed, government itself is, is uh, so mistrusted uh, mm -hmm. that opposition to the government, including uh, armed opposition to the government, is uh, legitimate even within a modern democracy. An idea that's considered quite anachronistic in much of, uh, uh, of Europe and indeed yeah. of the coastal and northern United States. Well, well, some of that idea of armed resistance to the government kind of brings us into the the contemporary, the, the, the very current uh, environment that we're in right now uh, in the last couple of weeks. And so I think that's a good idea. To, it's a good time to bring up something that uh, both sides in the last year or so, but it's, you know, uh, more freshly on the right, both sides in America of the sort of left traditional left right divide have shown themselves to have an illiberal element to them. Uh, so I want to sort of invite each of you to talk about the illiberal element on sort of quote unquote your side. Uh, maybe George talk about the what do you think what what do you think is the source and the the root of the illiberal element that we're seeing on the right? The source is is an epidemic of grievance, the the cult of victimization, which has flourished on the left for a long time, but now has been adopted on the right as a kind of we've developed. In the last few years, a kind of crybaby conservatism, where conservatives say everyone's picking on me: Hollywood, academia, the media, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, well, the grievances are real in the sense that uh, a lot of these in institutions have have been uh, conquered by the left's long march through the institutions. The fact is that conservatives are not are, are hardly uh, embattled in that sense. Uh, there's vast array of, uh, of means now of getting one's message out. There's an enormous amount of good writing from the conservative side. So it seems to me the idea that the conservatives, uh, conservatives should get over sort of relishing their embattled uh, status as they see it. And get, again, get on with the argument because uh, conservatives have done rather well. I. Uh, I cast my first presidential vote in 1964 for Barry Goldwater out of the Southwest that uh, Stephen was talking about. Uh, and after he lost 44 states, uh, everyone said, well, that's the us. We're going to hear that. Well, Republicans won five of the next six presidential elections. So our, our parties are, are flexible. They're sensitive seismographs trembling to every quiver of, uh, of public opinion, and they adapt. So uh, it, it seems to me conservatives should uh, quit hunkering down and join the fray. Well, I think the culture of victimhood is a, a, an important ingredient to the current moment, especially on the left and, and the academic left. There's an insightful analysis by a pair of sociologists, Bradley Campbell and Jason Manning, and uh, alluding to the, the uh, culture of honor that I mentioned as the core of the kind of the um, uh, institutional uh, ethos of a, a lot of the, uh, the American South and Southwest. So they contrasted it as originally, I think Norbert Elias, the German sociologist, did with a culture of dignity, which is that you achieve uh, honor and status and, uh, and, and esteem and worth, not by a willingness to retaliate against uh, insults as in the culture of honor, but the opposite with a uh, demeanor of self-control and uh, dignity controlling your emotions. Something of course that you can afford to do if you're protected against violence by your police and court system. So the, the culture of dignity arose with the consolidation of the, uh, of the state uh, in European history. And Campbell and Manning identify now a third um, uh, ethos, which they call the culture of victimhood. Now they did not apply it, as far as I remember, to American conservatism. And it's ironic that it, that it probably does apply, but rather to campus uh, politics and ethics, where now you achieve status by being part of a, uh, a victim group, being victimized, something that, again, you have the luxury of doing if you've got an institutional infrastructure that's willing to uh, punish your uh, enemies, your, your alleged oppressors, 
uh, that uh, provides an opening to take advantage of that, in the case of universities, the campus um, uh, harassment bureaucracy that allows you to press your interests and your status by claiming victimhood uh, status. Yes, the bias response teams and all the rest. And you not only acquire status by being uh, acquiring victimhood, you acquire special exemptions and rights. Cornell University has now said that, that, that it will be mandatory to be inoculated for all students against seasonal flu unless you're a, a person of color and feel because of centuries of ab abuse of your body that you can't trust uh, uh, you, authorities to in inject you with things. Therefore, this heritage of victimization gives you a, a special status, even a, a kind of right. Yeah, I, I noticed that the, the language of victimhood has been used very much also to, to clamp down on free speech, that, you know, speech that you don't like is victimizing you. It is a form of violence. And I know, Stephen, you've been uh, in some ways the uh, on the receiving end of that. I also saw uh, there was a university recently that banned George Will from speaking as well uh, as, a, uh, as an unwelcome person. But Stephen, could you comment on the, the troubles you've had with that as well? Uh, yeah, in, in, indeed. There is this uh, peculiar notion that uh, harm and hurt are uh, legitimate reasons for clamping down on, on speech. The absurdity being that, uh, of course, anyone feel, uh, can have their feelings hurt by hearing an opinion that they, they don't like. That's a, a pretty basic feature of human nature. We tend to uh, identify uh, our own self-worth by the various shibboleths and, and beliefs and dogmas of our tribe. And it's, it's unpleasant to see those challenged. I mean, we all take a, a lot of pleasure in reading uh, op-eds that agree with us and uh, get annoyed by reading those that disagree with us. I mean, that's a, a feature of human nature that we ought to recognize and uh, control. And it is a, 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 a regrettable development that, um, uh, that those feelings are now legitimized. That is that if, if, if an opinion makes you uh, feel bad, that is a, a pretext for suppressing it. A, a, a dangerous road, needless to say. There's been a two steps here. One is to, that uh, speech is violence if it uh, hurts your feelings. But th then this summer we got a permutation of that, which is silence is violence. <laughs> that if indeed you don't uh, you don't uh, verbally loudly assent to a certain catechism uh, on a, of a political agenda, you are by your silence. Uh, injuring people. So it's it's a pretty comprehensive speech regulation. It, you know, it, some someone once said this had a big impact on me as a writer that uh, uh, years ago, somebody once said a good op-ed should cause the reader to throw down his newspaper in a fit of pique. And uh, I think I've always aspired to that a little bit. Uh, but you know, that the idea that that would then be a bad thing is is the the idea that has come up recently. But what I want to talk now about is is what does what common ground do we have here? I think there is actually a lot of common ground between you know we're used to arguing left versus right and you know over issues of you know should we have government uh, medic uh, a government uh, health care program versus not a government health care program and disagreeing on those things. But I also want to talk about what it is we have in common and, and what the common ground is. And and one of the things that that emerged earlier was the phrase Stephen used: equal rational individuals. Uh, which ties very much to 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 what to what you said, George. So I want to invite you to talk about um, what it is you think uh, um, is the common ground that we can work from. I think the common ground is that, that uh, we're persuadable, that everyone should be persuadable on on the agenda. I mean, look at what we're really not arguing about anymore. We argue about the uh, the modalities of Obamacare, but the, the country has long since settled the argument about having a social safety net, about having what we used to call a welfare state, we now call the entitlement state. We're arguing about marginal issues and splittable differences, which is what makes the current frenzies and furies so strange to me because they're really not about public policy. Uh, Barack Obama's greatest achievement was when he entered the office, there was not a national consensus that there should be, uh, everyone should have health care regardless of pre-existing conditions. Eight years later, there is that consensus. And we're going to work around that consensus uh, and work with it going forward. Uh, 
it seems to me from Elizabeth Warren on the left to Ted Cruz on the right, the political class is much more united by class interest than it is divided by ideology. They all agree that we should have a large, uh, generous welfare state and not pay for it. Everyone's agreed. We're gonna, we're gonna borrow the, the necessary money. Uh, the Democrats have what they call modern monetary theory, which they praise and embrace, and the Republicans denounce it and embrace it. It's all the same. So on, on the big issue, the public policy issues, there's precious little argument. What, we, what drives today's uh, bitterness is the sense of that the other side despises its opponents, that condescension is in the air. It, it's a matter of it's status anxiety all around. And, and, and that makes it rather hard to uh, have a, a regime of persuasion. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree that, that we should uh, identify the common ground. And indeed, the, uh, the fact that there does not exist a prosperous liberal democracy without a substantial uh, welfare state uh, and regulation um, is, a, is a data point that we should uh, acknowledge that, um, in fact, it's kind of a liberal Burkeanism. That is, this is the way every affluent democracy works. So the idea that you uh, cut the social safety net down to the, the, the minimum or, or to zero is a radical idea uh, in the context of uh, existing so successful social arrangements. I myself was, uh, uh, had, a, had a, an epiphany a number of years ago when I just looked at a graph of percentage of GDP uh, redistributed among OECD countries. Uh, how much of a welfare state do countries have? And they're all within a pretty narrow range. I mean, you've got United States and Canada at about 20%, you've got France at about 30%, but there just doesn't exist an affluent democracy that doesn't have it. And uh, that indeed is something that is like, like other issues such as uh, racial segregation, um, uh, equality, gender equality in, in the law, uh, gay rights, gay marriage, uh, issues that used to be controversial that no longer are. And I think Burke was right, and ironically, it's now an argument for a kind of, uh, a kind of progressivism that we ought to take a look at what social arrangements seem to be more or less working across the world and take that as a, as a kind of default. It could, it could be a lot worse. Uh, let's try to make it a, a little bit better, but uh, countries have uh, universal health care system, health insurance. Uh, it's a radical for a country not to have it, and we should just acknowledge that as uh, the, the current state of the art. And, and that might expand the amount of common ground that we, uh, that we recognize. And of course, my, my, my thing is that in general, we should be far more aware of data on human well-being, both across countries and uh, over periods in history. I can, to, to, the, to the extent that I'm a, a progressive or a liberal, it, it's that, that I believe in progress. Actually, most progressives hate progress, by the way. Okay. Um, so, but uh, uh, simply looking at graphs of human well being, uh, longevity, violence, um, uh, freedom, um, poverty, and seeing how they improve, it says, telling us something that we have no right to divine by intuition or to, or derived from dogma. It's something that where we have to learn from the state of the world. And that is that something about our social arrangements are, are, are better than they used to be. Uh, let's build on what has worked. Let's, and just as we look at changes over time as a kind of signal from the world to challenge our, our dogmas and our preconceptions, we should look at comparisons across countries. And that is a, another way in which um, I, I have been pushed in a somewhat you know, liberal progressive direction in that uh, if you compare national statistics of measures that everyone agrees are good things, educational attainment, health, um, uh, lack of teenage uh, pregnancy, lack of drug addiction, lack of substance abuse, lack of obesity, the United States doesn't do so well. We're not number one. We're, we're, we're better than uh, you know, a lot of uh, Africa and, and uh, uh, South Asia, but we're way behind a lot of uh, Western and Northern Europe and uh, former you know, British Commonwealth countries. We should take that as a, as a signal that we're not doing everything that we, we could do to, to make one another better off.
now, now that that raises something. What I've, I'm so glad you went this direction because one of the reasons I I thought I wanted to get the two of you together for a conversation was I expected that you know when you get Stephen Pinker on, he's going to talk about graphs and data. <laughs> And, and that sort of scientific social science approach to it. And I thought, well, when you get George Will on, he, he's going to quote Edmund Burke. Now, you've confounded me a little, Stephen, by doing both of those things. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about that, that difference. You know, if, we, if, if persuadability and persuasion is the real big common ground here, the difference in, in maybe methods, so sort of a more of a social science method and more of a philosophical or humanities method. And I, I wanted to see if, George, if you would comment on that. To pick up where Stephen just left off, it seems to me that to be a 18th century Enlightenment libertarian liberal, which is to say to be a conservative as I understand it in the American context, is to believe in natural rights. But to believe in natural rights is to believe, if, if you uh, don't import some kind of theism into this, to believe in natural rights is to be a rule utilitarian. What natural rights language, as you say, is, as a rule, uh, experience teaches that the following rights are important to human flourishing. This gets me to what uh, Stephen was talking about, which is data. Let's find out who's flourishing and what we're going to consider flourishing and, and, and what, as a rule, produces flourishing. So uh, the more we can reduce politics to not entirely, of course, but can reduce politics somewhat to an empirical discussion, the better. And, and this, this brings in, uh, this is where you get, get the data. You, you reduce natural rights arguments to arguments about uh, what the world has learned about flourishing. But, but I also want to talk about what is it that, that the more the philosophical principles bring in order to helping you to understand what the questions are to ask and how to interpret the data and the wisdom that comes from the, the, you know, the philosophical discussion of philosophical principles, perhaps when combined with the data. Well, George has uh, actually put together the two approaches that at least in moral philosophy 101 are always set, aside, set apart as the two poles, namely utilitarianism and deontology or the notion of, of uh, natural rights. Now, and I, I agree that that distinction is drawn too sharply but some of the 18th century, I don't know if you want to call them liberals or not, but uh, Jeremy Bentham, Cesare Beccaria, the founders of uh, classical utilitarianism, um, you did say greatest good for the greatest number uh, added up. And that doesn't, of course, as, as we know from intro moral philosophy, that doesn't always comport with um, uh, individual rights, as in the, the textbook thought experiments. You know, if the patient comes in for a you know, a bunion operation and you um, decide, and there's a, a, another patient who needs a heart transplant, a second who needs a liver transplant, a third who needs a kidney transplant and so on. Do you euthanize the, uh, the patient who's come in, distribute his organs and save five lives at the cost of one? Uh, it's greatest good for the greatest number, but that's where we draw the line and say, uh-uh, the, the, the rights trump the, uh, the, the additive sum of uh, welfare. But of course, those the, the thought experiments are, are extreme, and uh, and I do tend to agree that the natural rights tend to be the best way to achieve the greatest good for the the, uh, the greatest number. And I consider that to be the great contribution of late 18th century Enlightenment um, thinking, perhaps classical liberalism. Although John Stuart Mill, in the spilling over into the following century, deserves some of the uh, credit as well. But the idea that there is a basis for morality that is not theocratic, doesn't come from scripture, from God's commandments, uh, namely that whether you conceptualize it in terms of um, uh, equal rights, that what I want for myself, I can't deny to you just because I'm me and you're not, that's logically uh, incoherent, together with the notion of if everyone's better off, uh, who could argue against that? Um, those give you a, a secular basis for morality, not, not scriptural, um, at, at that, uh, uh, that I consider to be a core of the uh, Enlightenment contribution and indeed uh, classical liberalism. Uh, now, I want to end by sort of, well, first of all, I want to say that, that part of what I'm trying to do here is, is bring together people who are from different strains of what you might call liberalism. So for example, I'm going to be uh, 
uh, if 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 we were talking about my views, I would be more radical by by Stephen's uh, uh, estimate on the issue of the welfare state, where I think there is a case on data and principle to be made against it. But that will wait for another day. But I want to talk about what do you think is the way to go forward, and not necessarily to get each other to, to get always to 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 build a consensus where we all agree with each other, but to be able to cooperate together and to I think to to shore up the foundations of of liberalism broadly conceived. Well, let me go. Hey, I, yeah. I, I think you're asking how do we how do we move forward in the United States yeah. uh, to, a, to a more civilized politics? Mm -hmm. I think first of all we have to relearn certain habits. Uh, that's I've recommended that the Biden administration began with a big expensive infrastructure project because there's something in it for everybody and you can split the differences and it'll get people back into the habit of legislative bargaining which is inherently additive you support my project i'll support your project and we'll all get the third guy's project and that's that's why uh, legislative bargaining always grows the government, but that's a transaction cost of democracy and you learn to live with. Well, well if we did this, we'd begin to reacquire the, the habits of bargaining and of negotiating and chatting and talking. Just, it, it's shocking that we have to talk about relearning these things uh, as we approach 250 years as a republic, but we do. Uh, beyond that, it, it, it seems to me we ought to uh, start teaching American history better. Uh, no nation can survive that doesn't produce elites that believe in the nation. Uh, and we need history taught by grown-ups who teach that history is a record of what grown-ups did in difficult circumstances. And the great conservative virtue is prudence, which is the process of applying pristine principles to untidy reality. And we ought to be able to go back and understand that Lincoln was a great man, and so was Grant, and, and Madison was a genius. And uh, long story short, we have to get away from the 1619 project approach to understanding our past. Stephen. Well, I, I tend to agree that uh, we have to uh, reinforce starting with education but continuing in journalism uh, what has worked not just what has failed and the fact that uh, constitutional democracy was you know an awful lot better than absolute monarchy a lot better than uh, anarchy a lot better than theocracy is something that we ought to know and that should not be tendentious that's uh, I think a demonstrable fact like what and continuing to the present that uh, uh, if we uh, I, I completely agree with George that to the extent that we can remove the sectarian and tribal uh, symbolism of issues and make them transactional, uh, we can get a, a lot more done. And that we should be conscious of the tendency that we have toward uh, political tribalism and um, consider that to be a problem that we ought to minimize. And so when it comes, say, to climate change, uh, Al Gore should not be the spokesperson because he gives it a left-wing brand and uh, you've already politicized an issue that ought not to be politicized. Likewise with, uh, with infrastructure and, and uh, I, I think George pointed to an a, a unintended consequence of a lot of the push toward both transparency in government and uh, an end to cork barrel projects. That was a big issue in the, in the, in the 90s and early 2000s. But what I think wasn't appreciated at the time is to get stuff done. You need um, you know, some, some amount of, of log rolling, some amount of uh, favor trading. And uh, you also need the kind of um, discreetness and uh, benevolent hypocrisy that we all depend on to get along in everyday life. You don't just blurt out everything you think if you want to maintain your friends and peace, peace at, at home. There's a certain amount of systematic discretion, uh, confidentiality, lack of transparency that you need. If everything is out there, then the kind of compromises, sometimes you know, dirty compromises that need to get things done uh, become impossible. So we need a little bit of, uh, more acknowledgement of uh, human nature in the actual conduct of, uh, of, of government. Um, I, I think it's, it, is, it is a stupendous challenge of how to back off from this, uh, the, this 
ideological tribalism or sectarianism that is now both paralyzing the actual operation of government and um, uh, raising the temperature and enabling violence uh, uh, in, in their political arena. Uh, recognizing that it is a problem is at least the first step toward dealing with it. And we've got to keep it in mind as uh, among the challenges that we face are not just how to do what ought to be done, but how to uh, take it out of the uh, left wing, right wing, Red Sox, Yankees, good guy, bad guy, Hatfield, McCoy dynamic. And uh, which is why to come back to where I began a, a discussion today, which is individualism is the heart of the matter. Because when you focus on individuals as freely consenting, agency possessing, rights possessing, uh, consenters and persuadable people, then th that's the solvent. That, that's how you dissolve tribalism. It turns out tribalism is natural. Individualism is unnatural. I agree. For the unnatural. I totally agree. But there you're going to, without an extra uh, couple of commentaries, you're going to raise the ire of communitarians, both left and right, who Good. say, well, the atomized individual is uh, uh, an idealization that doesn't, that's not the way we work. We're inherently social, we're inherently community based, all of which is true. Uh, and I think one has to separate the psychology that yes, we are tribal creatures. We all, we belong to families and communities. Uh, on the other hand, when it comes to uh, articulating the base for government and for laws and for government coercion, the idealization that it is a social contract negotiated among individuals is the, the best way to have a, uh, a human government, even though, of course, people live in communities and they have families and they cooperate with each other. But the individual as the entity that actually feels pleasure and pain and happiness and, uh, and misery, uh, whereas the collective doesn't, uh, except metaphorically, that the individual is the ultimate beneficiary of uh, policies and the ultimate uh, entity that suffers if it becomes oppressive is the way we should negotiate our social arrangements while completely acknowledging the inevitable objection that we are social beings. Yes, the communitarians have lit upon the obvious with a sense of profound and original discovery, which is that we're socially situated. Get, get over it. Uh, the fact is, in our social situations, we are individuals exercising choices and agency. And uh, some people would like to be less immersed than others would in their communities. Let a thousand flowers bloom. Well, I, I, what George said something I really liked, which is talking about the, the habit of talking. And so I'm very glad that we've gotten the two of you together to talk and have this conversation. And I hope that we can uh, make a habit of doing this sort of thing. Uh, so I really want to thank both of you for coming on. Thanks, George. And thanks, Stephen. Mm -hmm. Enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you, George. Nice to meet you, Robert. My guests today have been George Will and Stephen Pinker. I'm Rob Trosinski with Symposium Magazine. If you enjoyed this discussion, check out the magazine at symposium.substack.com. Uh, also, uh, subscribe to the podcast, subscribe to the YouTube channel for more conversations like this one. And thank you for joining the conversation.